SCP-3989, The Bone Orchard. The SCP Foundation deals with quite a lot of dangerous threats in their work. Monsters, diseases, extra-dimensional gateways, mimetic hazards, and so on. One of the groups that often combines all these things and more are the Sarkic Cults, and 3989 especially combines these. Going into a Sarkicism SCP, there's one thing you can definitely rely on it to contain in spades, and that's body horror. Considering that 3989 contains a handful of exploration logs, let's hop on for a little roller coaster ride of gore. SCP-3989 takes us to a small olive orchard in Syria, where its owner began to sell exceptionally large amounts of crops considering the small size of his orchard. Since you might even say there were anomalously large amounts of crops, the foundation swooped in and started asking questions. The owner was tight-lipped, but eventually they discovered that there was indeed an anomaly present on the orchard, and they seized the property. The owner and his family were questioned, amnesticized, and released, but it seems they were completely clueless about the true nature of the anomaly. The SCP itself is an unstable, stationary, unaided, wide-area, safe, two-way, cyclic, space-time anomaly, which is a bit of a mouthful. Basically, within the orchard, there is a 30 meter wide space that affects local space-time, so that when someone enters it, it alters local geometry. Most of the time, entering this area will simply result in entering into a much larger olive orchard, which is how the farmer was able to produce so many olives out of his small grove. GPS tracking fails in this space, but radio and other signals can still function normally. Overall, not incredibly sarcic, but if one enters this space from a westward direction after sunset, then things get much more interesting. If entering the zone in this situation, the individual will eventually disappear completely as they travel to a separate extra-dimensional space. This space is also filled with trees, but these trees have undergone varying degrees of ossification meaning the formation of bone material, hence the title. Additionally, the area is home to a number of different forms of life, which all bear a strong genetic similarity to humans. Human life twisted into new and horrific forms is pretty par for the course for sarcasm. We'll get to the exploration logs in a second, but an important part of appreciating SCP-3989 is understanding the timeline of events. The orchard was first discovered around 2009, and the initial containment procedures were a chain-link fence topped with barbed wire around the perimeter. Some security forces were placed around the area to keep out civilians, and a nearby facility was constructed to house any other anomalies that originated from the zone. These were pretty basic containment protocols, and they were in place for quite a while as the Foundation hadn't discovered the extra-dimensional space. In 2014, however, as they were testing prolonged exposure to the alien geometry of 3989, their tests carried on after sunset, and a D-Class managed to enter the extra-dimensional space. The D-Class in question, Herrick, is a former Foundation agent that was demoted for reasons unknown, although that's not especially relevant to the proceedings. He's equipped with audio and video surveillance equipment and sent on through. As he walks through 3989 and nears the point where he'll disappear, he comments on a rising smell, like old blood. He also sees a number of small, worm-like creatures, warm to the touch and very soft. He collects some of them in a bag, along with a white powder coating the trees. As he continues to move, the smell and the quantity of maggots in the area continues to grow before he finally passes into 3989 proper. Although it was dark on the other side, Herrick now sees a growing ambient light fill the area, and he swears that he's being watched. The trees have now changed, filled with what seems to be red leaves. Upon closer inspection, the leaves are pulsing, like hearts, and fluid can be seen quickly moving through the branches. Herrick pulls on a branch, and it breaks, releasing a steady stream of a thick black fluid onto his hand. 
He places the broken branch in a bag as he gags and looks down, seeing that his legs are now covered with the small white worms. This is apparently enough for Herrick, as he states that he's done and begins walking back, despite the protests from the supervisor, Dr. Gosley. A loud cracking sound is heard on the camera, followed by a deep guttural sound, causing Herrick to turn and see a large, pale limb moving out of sight behind a tree. He begins running at this point, and doesn't stop until he leaves 3989. Upon returning, none of the worms could be found on his legs, but they did confirm that the branch and white powder were human bone, and the red leaves consisted of human cardiac tissue. Herrick was reprimanded for abandoning the experiment early, but agreed to go back in with another D-class as long as they were both given firearms. The request was granted, and the two are sent in to identify that large creature that Herrick glimpsed, as well as to ascertain the extent of the space. They enter in, soon coming across the tree where Herrick broke off a branch, finding that the black fluid is still streaming out. They collect some of the fluid in a jar, and notice that the white worms are excreting bone material to repair the branch. Moving ahead, they begin to find trees that are bearing fruit, which appear to be moving. The other D-Class is ordered to retrieve one of the fruits, while Herrick stands wary with his firearm ready. As the D-Class grabs one of the fruit, it ruptures, spilling out worms across his arm. He quickly brushes them off, and a sound is heard off-camera. The D-Class's camera suddenly lifts skyward, and Herrick turns to see the lower half of the man's body fall to the ground. He pans up to see a four-meter-tall pale humanoid with no nose, eyes, or ears. Herrick rapidly fires his weapon at the target, causing it to bleed but show no signs of pain. The entity reaches out and strikes Herrick, causing his camera feed to go out as well. Herrick gets posthumously reinstated to Foundation Service, as both are listed as KIA. You know the drill by now then. The D-Class have finished painting the floors red, so it's time to send in the MTF. A team well trained with extra-dimensional spaces, MTF Zeta-9, Mole Rats, is tasked with properly exploring the zone, as well as retrieving the samples collected by the D-Class. Most of the personnel assigned to 3989 had deemed additional human interaction with the space to be an unnecessary risk, as it would probably be more prudent to send in some drones. Dr. Gosley, however, insisted that the MTF get sent in, getting approval from a superior to authorize it. Only a small team of mole rats get sent in though, just three agents, designated Charlie, X-Ray, and Delta. As the team enters, they find the ground to be covered in hundreds of worms, and beneath them is a thick layer of red, fleshy material. Gosley tells them not to take any samples, as the last two who did ended up KIA. They eventually come to the scene where the two D-Class died, but find Herrick's body naked, upside down, and crucified on a nearby tree. Several symbols are carved in his skin and a large mass of worms are attached to the trunk of the tree. Sifting through the mass of worms, they find the jar of samples collected earlier, and they continue on. After a few minutes, they emerge from the hazy bone orchard and see a large open valley in front of them. The sky is yellow, and the valley is covered in red plant life. Several of the large pale humanoids can be seen amidst the valley through Delta's camera. Both Charlie and X-Ray claim they can't see the entities, and they also don't appear on their camera footage. They proceed down through the valley, avoiding close contact with the pale entities, who also seem to ignore them. At one point, Charlie bumps into a bone tree, and suddenly can see the entities, startling her. When X-Ray touches the tree as well, she can also see the entities, so there's some sort of connection. They continue on and the pale entities continue to follow the three, stressing each of them out. Eventually, they notice that the trees start to look a little different compared to the ones in the bone orchard. The trunk of the tree resembles an enlarged vertebral column with musculature on one side. 
The red foliage is present on the tree, but also possesses foliage similar to bronchial tubes. They pull out an ultrasound device that had been given to them to investigate fruits on the trees without touching them. X-Ray hesitantly climbs the tree and places the ultrasound device next to a fruit, causing it to twitch. Pale humanoids begin to gather around the base of the tree, releasing guttural sounds. When asked if they received the ultrasound data, Ghazali responds that it's beautiful, and remarks that the entities won't engage unless they damage the orchard, although how exactly he knows that is a little unclear. X-Ray decides to probe another piece of fruit, but this one ruptures almost immediately, releasing a small humanoid creature with four legs, two pelvises, and an exposed spine. The creature quickly crawls up her arm, down her back, and out of sight, causing X-Ray to fall out of the tree. The pale entities don't move, but the mole rats claim to begin hearing something that isn't picked up by the cameras. Delta describing it as feeling like someone is grabbing her liver and giggling in her face. At this point, the pale entities converge on the group, with two of them emerging from the ground. One of the entities seems to be the same one fired upon by Herrick. With at least ten of these large entities converging on them, the team quickly decides to abort the mission and flee, but Ghazali insists that they keep pushing forward. Charlie tells him to just send in a drone. X-Ray's camera then shows a smaller humanoid, about 1.7 meters in height, peeking from behind a tree. The team doesn't seem to notice though, as they backtrack through the valley and watch as the pale entities throughout the area observe them, several of them appearing to be smiling. Ghazali chastises them, saying that they are making a terrible mistake. An unknown voice is then heard stating, leave and be devoured, stay and shed your mortality. The wild beckons. The team assumed that this came from Ghazali, but he says that it wasn't him. The voice is heard again, saying, Kythera awaits the vessels chosen. Come forth unto Orok and receive your just reward. As the team continues to run, they see more entities emerge that are human-sized, and laughter is heard throughout the remaining footage. There is also the sound of combat, but the source cannot be determined. The ultrasound data from the fruit shows that small instances of the pale entities are growing in each of the fruit of the vertebra trees. For the record, Kythera is typically regarded as an important headquarters of sarcasm although its specific location and nature is up for debate. According to SCP-2217, Kythera was an island in Greece that was eventually taken over by the Church of the Broken God. It's possible that the actual Kythera is a much more mystical and mythical location, still controlled by Sarkites. A note tells us that Orak is a Sarkic prophet associated with war, the hunt, betrayal, and loyalty, credited with the original conquest of Kythera. The voice seemed to imply that Orak, or a part of him, was present somewhere in SCP-3989, but the mystery isn't over yet. It's clear by this point that something is a little off with Dr. Ghazali, and we'll get to exactly what it is later, but it's perhaps not surprising then that Ghazali personally leads a group of security agents into 3989. Ghazali explains that previous expeditions were marred by human frailties of fear and mortality, so he'll be leading this one in order to find Kythera and the Temple to Orok within 3989, based on a previously discovered text. A note tells us that there's no record of the Foundation finding any text within 3989, so they're not sure what Ghazali meant. Ghazali is joined by three agents, Gulf, India, and Echo, and they are being remotely observed by a technician. Ghazali says that they'll be fine as long as they don't make the first move against any entities, and both himself as well as Echo and India exhibit some rather stilted grammar in their dialogue. 
Gulf, on the other hand, seems to be the most nervous of the group as they enter into 3989. The technician asks if they've seen the Halcost, to which Gulf is surprised to hear that they're going after a Karsist. A Halcost, in Sarkic mythology, is a collection of anomalous entities controlled through pheromones by a Karsist, basically a high-ranking Sarkic priest. It seems it's Gosley's plan to find this Karsist, a plan that Gulf thinks is a very bad idea. Echo asks the technician if Gulf has been initiated, and when Gulf seems confused, the other two agents turn and open fire. A swarm of the small worms come out of the ground and quickly consume Gulf's body. Although India expresses some sadness at having to kill Gulf, Gosley says that they shouldn't grieve for the blind and deaf, for wonderful sights and sounds await them. As they continue walking, they find that the geography and topology of the area is different than past explorations, with no valley present. The unknown voice can be heard again, asking who brings this offering, stating that the world of man walks in ignorance and frailty, and repeating the word reap for a few minutes. The change in scenery seems to even confuse Gosley, who expected to find the valley and a temple. Suddenly, India asks Echo to shoot Gosley, but when India raises his gun, Echo instead shoots him. Gosley is now very confused, but Echo explains that since Orok is a prophet of betrayal and loyalty, this demonstration of both loyalty and betrayal will allow them to find the temple. Sure enough, the unknown voice speaks again, stating that the harvest has been fulfilled, the hunt begins. Based on the dialogue, it sounds like Gosley didn't know that Echo was on the same side as him until now, although why he didn't ask about that when they killed Golf is a little unclear. The technician is also affected, as he tells the two to go and reap. India's body camera, which was swallowed up by the ground, records a black stone hallway as his body is carried by one of the pale entities. As the other two turn, the topography of the area shifts in front of them, revealing a large valley and a black stone temple complex. The architecture of the temple suggests Mesoamerican and Sumerian influences, and Gosley remarks that this place is truly ancient, and it's possible that even the Grand Karsist himself may have walked here. India's camera footage shows his body and Gulf's body on stone altars surrounded by humanoids. Back with Echo and Gosley, Echo hears a sound and turns while Gosley remarks on the beauty of the reliefs on the walls. When Echo turns back, Gosley is gone. The unknown voice speaks again, saying that a Roman soldier once explained to them that warfare is an honorable enterprise but it was the Romans that coined the phrase, divide and conquer. Gosley turns to see that Echo is missing, and the temple complex is beginning to spatially distort around him. He starts to climb a pyramid structure near him that appears to be stable. Echo, meanwhile, is seeing similar distortions, and he retreats to a nearby outcrop with his rifle in hand. He calls out on the radio to both Gosley and the technician, but only gets a response from the unknown voice, who states that they are here. Echo asks who it is, and the voice simply responds with, I live. At this point, four of the humanoids emerge from the ground near Echo, one of them pulling a sword from the center of its chest and pointing it at Echo. The four of them slowly move towards him, the other three producing long glaives from their arms. Echo opens fire to little effect as Gulf's body camera turns back on, apparently behind Echo. A hand resembling that of the humanoids is shown, but in a Foundation security uniform, and it plunges the dagger into Echo's neck. Gosley has reached the top of the pyramid structure and retreats into a chamber inside of it. The chamber is anomalously large on the inside, 
and Gazali sees a number of pulsating red structures along the walls. There's a light at the far end, so he runs toward it, eventually running into a large chamber surrounded by stadium seating. Gazali falls into the center of this small stadium, where the floor is covered in a pool of viscous black fluid. As he looks around, he sees that the seats are filled with the humanoids, chanting in an unknown language. A large door on the opposite side opens, releasing two of the tall, pale humanoids. Gulfs, Indias, and Echo's cameras all resume recording from a vantage point above Gosley. Gosley cries out that he is with them and wanted to help them, as he is just a simple pilgrim. The unknown voice speaks out, simply saying, Reap, and the pale humanoids quickly kill Gosley, ending all video footage. Seven days after this, one of the vertebra trees spontaneously appeared in the atrium of the nearby Foundation site, bearing four large fruits. The four fruits soon ruptured, releasing four humanoids genetically identical to Gosley, Echo, India, and Gaul. Site records show that these entities were returned to active duty. The exploration logs are done, but you probably recall earlier when I mentioned the timeline of events being important. This was clearly an important Sarkic anomaly, but it was contained by nothing more than a chain link fence, with Gosley given a full run of the show. Something was clearly affecting Gosley and others at the site, but no one else knew about it because they were able to redact and hide all of their work. For a number of years, the Foundation simply thought it was a weird olive orchard, not knowing about the effect of entering it after sunset. This changed in 2015, a year after the exploration logs, when a biological containment specialist named Dr. Marshall Grant came in to inspect the place. During the inspection, a number of anomalous entities poured out of 3989 and proceeded to tear through the fence. Dr. Grant activated the containment breach alarm, but the on-site security made no motions to stop the breach, as they were all affected, just like Gosley was. Instead, they proceeded to release all biological anomalies that were in containment there, leading to a firefight between the Sarkic forces and the inspection team, later joined by MTF agents from Damascus. Some of the entities managed to escape, though, and are still unaccounted for. Dr. Grant managed to survive the ordeal, and took control of the site. After the fight was over, Dr. Grant gave an interview in which he explains that he was looking through Foundation records when he stumbled upon 3989, an anomaly that is popping out strange entities in the middle of a war zone with only a fence for containment, and no pathologists on staff. He had called Gosley and left plenty of messages, but was ignored, with higher-ups telling him that everything was under control and not to worry about, as they had no reason to believe otherwise. Dr. Grant decided to come out and check for himself to confirm this. When he arrived, the whole place smelled rotten, with a kind of dusty yellow haze over the area. Other agents didn't report anything like that, and Dr. Grant explains that due to some prior work, he's been inoculated against basic cognitive hazards and hallucinogens. As they tried to call someone out to talk, since Dr. Grant really didn't want to enter the area, a number of the tall, pale entities emerged from the ground, initiating the firefight. Dr. Grant radios in for assistance and waits out the battle, eventually coming out when he hears helicopters overhead. He sees dead humanoids and dead humans, partially consumed. Entering into the facility, he found weird symbols on the walls, obviously mimetic hazards, and some of the personnel willingly surrender, leading Dr. Grant to believe that whatever is affecting these people doesn't work on everyone. In the atrium, he sees the vertebra tree, and he hears it breathing somehow. They had apparently been feeding it people in order to grow new entities. Dr. Grant notes that the current containment procedures state that the active area of 3989 is 12 meters in diameter, but in actuality it's much more than that, because it's growing. 
Information is added about the cognitive altering effect of 3989, which conceals the full active range of the area and anomalous activity. Extended exposure makes it so that an individual is much less likely to notice that anything is wrong, and also makes them much more curious about 3989. Long-term exposure, say in the case of Dr. Gosley, results in an obsessive or religious fascination with the area. Proper biosafety precautions seems to prevent this exposure, suggesting that it works through some sort of chemical means. The current containment protocols enforce these biosafety precautions, as well as the introduction of concrete barriers, security checkpoints, and a platoon of MTF agents equipped with anti-tank weaponry. These agents will enter the active zone twice a week from all four directions to incinerate any new growths. So far, this seems like it's working, but under Gosley's care, the active zone grew at least 18 meters in diameter. The final addendum for 3989 lists all of the designations for different entities within the zone, such as the worms, the trees, the tall, pale humanoids, and the regular-sized humanoids. A few of the entities have notes explaining that there are unconfirmed reports of these entities present in active zones of SCP-610, the flesh that hates, suggesting a prior successful breach of 3989. It also notes that the entities resembling Ghazali, Echo, India, and Golf are uncontained, with whereabouts unknown. The big aspect of horror related to sarcasm is of course the body horror, as many sarcic anomalies twist, distort, disfigure, and corrupt the human form in some terrible way. The idea that many of these anomalies were once normal human beings, and through some unimaginable process have contorted and distorted into such horrors, is pretty terrifying. The other aspect of sarcasm that is pretty scary is the idea that these types of horror can pop up anywhere around the world, and can conceal themselves, slowly and meticulously expanding and corrupting humanity. It's almost comical then that the original owner of the orchard just managed to make some profit off of it before getting sent on his way by the Foundation, with no real consequences. SCP-3989 doesn't offer any groundbreaking revelations for Sarkic mythology, and it doesn't offer any particularly original horror concepts, but it is creepy and unsettling, and that's all we really want from those crazy Sarkites.